I think that human agency has four irreducibly different dimensions. Um, the physical, the psychological, the ethical, and the intellectual. And that the modern theory of the will, which is the predominant uh, philosophical theory of uh, human action um, between the mid-17th and the mid-19th century, that theory tended to um, uh, collapse these dimensions, amalgamate them, confuse them, combine them in a single, in a single picture. Uh, so the philosophers who defended the modern, what I call the modern theory of the will thought of the will as the source of voluntary or intentional human action um, and for the most part as the source of human action in general so that a movement of your body only qualifies as your act, it's only imputable to you as an individual, as the agent, if it originates in your will. And since they thought that only voluntary conduct um, uh, can be justly punished, merits praise or blame, uh, they also thought of the will as the source of individual responsibility. And so you can see how the idea of action in general, the idea of intentional action, and the idea of action for which we're responsible is all compressed into a single picture. And uh, the picture is one which Ryle describes in the uh, third paragraph of the hand, in, sorry, the second paragraph of the handout. He writes, this is not Ryle presenting his own ideas, you understand, this is Ryle presenting ideas that he intends to criticize, to attack. He says, I think of some state of affairs which I wish to come into existence in the physical world, but as my thinking and wishing are unexecutive, they require the mediation of a further executive mental process. So I perform a volition which somehow puts my muscles into action. Only when a bodily movement has issued from such a volition can I merit praise or blame for what my hand or tongue has done. And you can see there in his um, description of this theory, you can see the idea that there's a psychological impetus which makes the movement attributable to me as an agent and makes me responsible for it. So the psychology and the ethics and the sheer general physical idea of agency as such are all combined in the picture. According to this picture, when we act, the action itself consists in some motion of the body or some thought in the mind, uh, but it's preceded and caused by an act of will or volition, a sort of choosing or deciding to do the act. And that's what makes it imputable to us as agent. Why did uh, philosophers think it was necessary to postulate this act of willing or choosing or deciding? Ryle um, explains, he says, my thinking and wishing are unexecutive. And that's right, that's the picture. The picture is, for example, um, Suppose that I'm hungry. It doesn't follow necessarily that I'm going to eat. I might be on a diet, I might choose not to eat. Uh, equally, suppose that I'm not hungry. I might eat nonetheless. I might have lost appetite because I'm not well or something and think that it would be good for me to eat, so I eat. What has happened is that the volition or willing to eat or the choosing or deciding to eat is present in the case where I eat and absent in the case where I don't. My attitude, preference, desire doesn't settle the question of whether I do the act or not. And that was why philosophers thought it was necessary to postulate this act of willing, uh, choosing or deciding. <laughs> so, there's, there's the picture. We have desire, 
or in uh, uh, Locke's philosophy, the uneasiness of desire, which is the sort of feeling of wanting something. And that causes the volition, the mental act of choosing or willing, and that in turn sets our limbs in motion when we act. That's the picture of action that's presented by the modern theory of the will. Now, that theory came under attack in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, I think it begins in the middle of the 19th century when physiology begins to exert a more important influence on the way that philosophers think about human action. But it's very clear in William James's Principles of Psychology at the end of the 19th century and then in Russell's analysis of mind, which follows James pretty closely, that the attack is on the idea that this willing or volition is needed in order for our desires, our attitudes, our motives to um, get us into motion. And so you see, for example, James in paragraph three writing, we don't have to have a sensation or a thought and then have to add something dynamic to it to get a movement. The popular notion that action must result from some super-added will force is a very natural inference from those special cases in which we think of an act for an indefinite length of time without the action taking place. So you can see he's saying that that volition or act of will doesn't need to occur. We don't need to postulate it in order to explain how human behaviour occurs. And um, then, in the 20th century, uh, particularly um, in, in, in Ryle's concept of mind and in some of Wittgenstein's writings, the uh, Brown book and the philosophical investigations in particular, the idea comes under attack that we should even think about voluntary action as having a specific as action that has, as bodily motion that has a specific kind of mental cause. So it's not just that we don't need to postulate volitions or acts of will in addition to desires. It's a mistake, Wittgenstein thinks, and Ryle thinks, it's a mistake to suppose that what makes some movement of my body qualify as voluntary or intentional or attributable to me personally as the agent, it's a mistake to think that that's about its mental causes. In fact, Wittgenstein says with a kind of amazing, amazingly radical, sort of insouciant attitude, well, maybe all that makes my, the movement of my body qualify as voluntary is that I'm not surprised when it happens. It's a very startling, radical idea. So there you can see that's an extension and a radicalization of the 19th century attack on the modern theory of the will which postulates volitions as causes of human action. And then after that, after Wittgenstein and Ryle, so we're talking about 1945 through really to the end of the century, other aspects of the modern theory come under attack. So for example, um, Jennifer Hornsby, challenges the idea that the act itself consists in some motion of the body. <coughs> um, the idea here, I think, is that for me, for example, to raise my arm is to perform an act, and my act is my raising of my arm, but my raising of my arm isn't the same thing as the rising of my arm. There's a little grammatical sign that we're talking about different things. So there you can see another element in the modern theory's picture coming under attack. Um, Harry Frankfurt argues that we shouldn't try to distinguish the movements of our bodies in which we're active from the ones in which we're passive by referring to anything as elevated in our psychology as an intention. We should be looking at aspects of our psychology that we share with other animals that also engage in activities of their own without being capable of intentions. So you can see that there are various elements of this story which are being criticised in the later 20th century. 
Um, so the attack on the theory seems to gather pace, starting with Bain in the middle of the 19th century, James, Russell, Ryle, Wittgenstein, and then on. So, so there we are. Now, my overall feeling about this attack on the modern theory of the will is that the criticisms generally hit their targets, but the attack is not nearly radical enough. And the reason for that is that the modern theory of the will, as I've uh, explained, is a theory of several different things at once. It's a theory of intentional action, of voluntary action, of action done for reasons, and of action in general. And that's what I've tried to pull apart. So that's what I mean when I say that human agency has four dimensions that are collapsed in the idea of the will. I think that what happened in the 20th century is that the modern theory came under attack, but the tendency to equate or to collapse or to reduce these aspects of human agency one to another persisted in spite of that. So if we really want to free ourselves from its influence, if we really want to make progress in the theory of action, that's where we need to look. I'm not suggesting, incidentally, that these four dimensions of human agency that I've distinguished are the only dimensions of human agency there are. That clearly isn't the case. I've missed out... What have I missed out? I've missed out the social dimension of agency, most obviously. Uh, but that isn't relevant to my story because what I'm interested in are the dimensions of agency that are collapsed into the idea of the will. And there, I think, as I've said, we have these four dimensions, which I've distinguished for you in the first paragraph of the handout. So we have the physical dimension of human agency. Each of these aspects or dimensions of human agency we think and we reason about by means of a specific <coughs> set of concepts. And I've indicated what some of the principal concepts um, in each case are. So we have the physical dimension of human action. And here the principal central concepts are ones like power, causation, change. We have the psychological dimension of human action. And here the concepts that we use are ones like desire, intention, aim, purpose, goal. Uh, the intellectual dimension of human agency, here we're thinking of course about reasons and reasoning, reasons for doing actions of certain kinds, the knowledge and belief that guide us when we act, that serve us, if you like, as premises to reason from when we're deciding what to do. And then finally we have the ethical dimension of human agency. Uh, and here, to my mind, the key concepts that we need to think about in order to understand this dimension and distinguish it from the others are the concepts of voluntariness and choice and ignorance and compulsion which negate voluntariness, as I'm going to explain now. So, uh, if I was allowed to give a three-hour lecture, um, <coughs> this is the sort of thing that, you know, obviously one dreams about and it thankfully never happens, I would try to show you uh, how in the um, philosophy of action in the, in the last um, 50 to 80 years, uh, how one can find uh, the confusions that exist between each pair of these different dimensions of agency. <laughs> but actually, I'm just going to focus on two. And um, if you want to explore the subject further, that's the way to do it. Um, so, I'm going to talk first about the distinction between the psychological and the ethical aspects of agency. And then I'm going to talk about the distinction between the psychological and the physical dimensions of agency. I'm going to start with the ideas of voluntariness and intention. So, when we think of an action as intentional, as the expression, in other words, of aim, purpose, desire, 
we're thinking about its psychological aspect. When we ask ourselves whether an agent acted out of choice, uh, whether an agent did an act voluntarily, we're interested in its ethical dimension. But if you look at philosophy in the last 70 years or so, when voluntariness was no longer explained in terms of acts of will or volitions, what you find is that intention, supplemented sometimes by knowledge or control, take the place of the idea of an act of will or volition in defining what makes an act qualify as voluntary. So, have a look at um, paragraph five on the uh, handout. Um, this is a, taken from Elizabeth Anscombe's book Intention, which is really one of the most influential texts in the philosophy of action in the last uh, um, 80 years. Anscombe um, does acknowledge that there is a difference between intentional action and voluntary action, between doing something intentionally and doing something voluntarily. She thinks that every intentional act is also voluntary, but she doesn't think that every voluntary act is also intentional. And why is that? Well, she gives a couple of kinds of examples. It may be because um, one is just fidgeting or drumming one's fingers on the table and so on. These sorts of mm, quasi-controlled, quasi-conscious acts, she thinks, could be described as voluntary, even though they're not intentional. And the other kind... Um, she is uh, um, a Catholic philosopher and committed to the doctrine of double effect. So the other kind of uh, act which she says is voluntary but not intentional is the unintended concomitant of intentional action, like, for example, so-called collateral damage in a military attack. In that case, she thinks, it isn't your intention to... Um, <coughs> kill civilians, um, damage a hospital. Uh, still, you do so voluntarily if you foresee that your act is going to have that uh, as a concomitant, the act itself being directed towards, we're supposing, a legitimate military target. So those are the kinds of cases where she thinks you have action that is voluntary but not intentional. In intention. Then, actually, a couple of uh, decades later, in an article that she published um, about uh, Brentano, I think, she pretty much equates voluntary and intentional action. She says, and this is paragraph six on the handout, a particular act of mine is voluntary because it's done for, uh, by me, either for its own sake or for the sake of something else. And that really is, in effect, the idea of intentional action, because uh, an act is intentional if you um, want to do it or value doing it, either for its own sake uh, or because it's conducive to something else that you want or, or value. Uh, Bernard Williams, in a rather similar vein, this is paragraph seven, says that a certain thing is done voluntarily, if very roughly, it's an intentional aspect of an action done in a normal state of mind. Um, Tony Kenny follows Anscombe in maintaining that uh, every um, intentional act is also voluntary. Um, Davidson just doesn't distinguish between voluntary action and intentional action. Um, he effectively equates them, both in the article Freedom to Act and in the article um, Psychology as Philosophy, I think it's called. I don't think it's philosophy or psychology. At any rate, so uh, what you have in effect is the idea that voluntariness can be defined in terms of intention, knowledge and control. It seems to me, though, that this can't be right. And the reason that it can't be right is that voluntariness is essentially an ethical Concept. It is a concept that is essentially involved in appraising human conduct 
and fundamentally in deciding innocence and guilt. I don't mean to imply that um, uh, only wrong acts are capable of being voluntary, which is a view that Ryle incautiously expresses, but, but the idea that informed that misjudged remark seems to me dead right, and that is that, as I say, voluntariness is essentially an ethical concept. Go back to uh, Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle explains that an act is voluntary if it is not due to ignorance and not due to compulsion. Now, that seems to me to be the starting point. And then one has to ask, well, why ignorance and compulsion? I mean, these are ideas of very different sorts. Ignorance is a, an epistemic concept. Compulsion is a causal concept. Why do we have an idea that, that yokes them together in this peculiar way, so that an act is counted as voluntary if it's not explained either by ignorance or by compulsion? And the answer has to be that ignorance and compulsion are normally exculpations. They're normally factors that exclude guilt. So that somebody is not guilty if they do an act, but they were forced to do it, or but they didn't know they were doing it. Both these ideas, compulsion and um, um, uh, ignorance, need some more refined uh, examination. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about compulsion. So, if, if that's right, uh, if an act is um, not voluntary, if it's due to compulsion, then the kind of case that we need to focus on in order to understand the difference between intentional action and voluntary action is action that is coerced, action that's done under duress, or alternatively, uh, action that's done because of an obligation. Because these are clearly cases where the act is intentional, but where the defence against the charge of culpability is that you were compelled to do the act. Um, is, that, is, that, is that point clear? Let me explain it a little bit further then. Um, so, what I want to insist on is that we need to distinguish between intentional conduct and voluntary conduct. And in order to distinguish between them, we need to focus on the kind of case where we do an act intentionally, but where we can defend our gain, ourselves against the charge that we're guilty because the act was wrong by saying that we were forced or compelled or obliged to do it. And the critical case is going to be a case of an act that's done under duress. Because in that case, you do the act in order to escape the threatened harm. You do it intentionally. That's your purpose in doing it. But you may say that the act wasn't done voluntarily, nevertheless, because you were forced to do it or compelled to do it because the threat was so severe. And this is, in fact, the orthodox position in English law. So if you have a look at um, paragraph 10, this is uh, the Lord Widgery, then Lord Chief Justice, in um, a case concerning duress that came up in the early 1970s, it's clearly established, he says, that duress provides a defence in all offences, including perjury, except possibly treason or murder as a principle, if the will of the accused has been overborne by threats of death or serious personal injury, so that the commission of the alleged offence was no longer voluntary, uh, the voluntary act of the accused. So, uh, 
This was a, a perjury case where the defendants had, were two young women who, in an earlier case, had said that they did not recognize the defendant, and the defendant was therefore acquitted, but it transpired that they said that they didn't recognize the defendant because they had been threatened by a friend of the defendant that their faces would be cut up if they identified the defendant in court. There were quite a number of cases involving a duress that came up in the courts at around this time, um, partly because, and, and this is in fact, I think the next one, DPP, the Northern Ireland versus Lynch, um, because uh, this was during the Irish Troubles and it happened from time to time that uh, members of the IRA or people working for another terrorist organization would hijack a taxi and tell the taxi driver to drive them to a place where they would rob a bank or murder a policeman and then the taxi driver was liable to be prosecuted as an accessory to the crime. And the defense, of course, was that uh, uh, he acted under duress. And so, in fact, the law of duress was quite considerably uh, developed uh, during that period. But there was a... The, the, the standard position remained, the one stated by Lord Widgery in the judgment from which I just uh, quoted a moment ago. But there, the opposite opinion was also expressed by some... Uh, judges and by more jurists and so I've put it for you there in paragraph 11. So this is Lord Justice Simon in um, Lynch 1975. He says in cases of duress there is power to choose between two alternatives but one of the alternatives is so disagreeable that even serious infraction of the criminal law seems preferable Duress is not inconsistent with act and will, the will being deflected, not destroyed. So you see, you can see how there are these two opposing views, one of which aligns voluntary action closely with intentional action, the other of which draws a deep division between them. And it is an important issue it's an important issue because duress is an absolute defence. That is, the, if it's found that the um, uh, defendant acted under duress, then he or she will be acquitted. Uh, it's not merely a mit mitigating factor that diminishes the criminality of an act. And that seems to be founded on the idea that the agent doesn't have a choice that the agent is compelled to act, that the agent doesn't act voluntarily. So there is some practical importance in deciding which of these positions about duress is true. Whether it's true, in fact, that compulsion can negative voluntariness in ways that fall short of applying main force, so that the act is still intentional, but it's not voluntary. If you think, if you side with uh, Lord Justice Simon um, and you think, therefore, that what duress does is not to render an act involuntary, but simply to provide an especially pressing incentive to somebody to commit a crime, then it's very difficult to defend the view that duress ought to be an absolute defence. Uh, because you are, in effect, open to the kind of argument that was expressed by uh, Justice Stephen, um, writing in the 1880s, I think, in um, his History of the Criminal Law of England, which I've quoted from in paragraph 13. So he writes, The criminal law is itself a system of compulsion on the widest scale. It is a collection of threats of injury to life, liberty and property if people do commit crimes. Are such threats to be withdrawn as soon as they are encountered by opposing threats? The law says to a man intending to commit murder, if you do it, I will hang you. 
Is the law to withdraw its threat if someone else says, if you do not do it, I will shoot you? Surely it is at the moment when temptation to crime is strongest that the law should speak most clearly and emphatically to the contrary. So in other words, you see that the implication of this remark is that defendants who are found guilty of a crime really ought to be punished more severely if they were subject to duress because we, should, we need, on our statute book, heavier penalties to deter people from committing crimes when they're going to be tempted to do so by threats of villainous people to the effect that they're going to be injured or killed if they don't commit the criminal act. And even if you think that that's wrong, because really we do need to temper punishment with humanity for the defendant, still it's very hard if you take this view to defend the position that duress ought to be an absolute defence rather than merely a mitigating um, factor. Because the idea that it's an absolute defence, that is that the defendant is innocent, does rely on the thought that they didn't do the act voluntarily. So it is a, a matter of some importance to decide whether we should which uh, of these two positions we should adopt regarding duress, and behind that, uh, how closely we should align intention um, and, in, um, and voluntariness. So, we have, I think, um, you know, arguments on both sides. On the one side, there is the conviction that the person threatened is literally able to choose whether to act as instructed or suffer the threatened harm so that a choice exists. That's a quotation from Hart and Honoré, that's paragraph 12. And then we have the opposing view, which is expressed by Robert Nozick in an article called Coercion, which I've reproduced for you in paragraph uh, 14. When a person gives way to coercion we want to say that it's not his own choice but someone else's, or not fully his own choice, or someone else has made his choice for him. But to my mind, the critical question that we have to ask is whether there are threats that are sufficiently severe that they qualify as compulsion and therefore negative, negate the voluntariness of an act. And I, I think myself that the orthodox position in English law is right and that we can see that if we really make a complete break with the idea that we should think about voluntariness in terms of mental causation and if we think about it indeed not as attaching exclusively to action but equally to con passivity, to conditions, to emotions and feelings and so forth, so that voluntariness is a much wider category than intention. Let me uh, explain here what I mean. So, if you think about voluntariness in terms of volition, in, terms of the, in the terms recommended by the modern theory of the will, so that voluntariness consists in motion of the body being caused by some internal mental act of willing or deciding, then it is going to be movements of your body, your own acts that qualify as voluntary or not. But actually, we are also interested in whether somebody receives an action voluntarily, not just whether they perform an action voluntarily. This is, of course, critically important in um, sex law, and, uh, and in, in um, uh, medical cases where we're interested essentially in consent. Consent is the mark of voluntariness on the part, not of the person doing the act, but the person receiving the act. <coughs> and if we simply set aside the modern theory of the will with its mechanism, its psychological mechanism of desire followed by volition, followed by motion of a limb, we set that aside entirely and just ask ourselves, how do we distinguish voluntary conduct from conduct that isn't voluntary? We can include the voluntariness of an act from the perspective of the patient, 
as well as from the perspective of the agent. And the mark, as I say, of voluntariness is going to be consent. So, for example, uh, what would qualify as a violent assault, cutting somebody open with a knife, in certain circumstances, uh, is, of course, completely legitimate because it's a surgical operation. Um, and similarly, of course, a sex act uh, is either legitimate or illegitimate, uh, legal or illegal, depending on the consent of the person receiving the act, uh, regardless of whether the act is caused by some uh, mental uh, um, choice or decision on the part of the agent. Furthermore, if you think, for example, about the case of rape, then it really should be obvious that there are forms of compulsion that fall short of main force. That is, that a threat can, in fact, compel and cancel the voluntariness of an act, even if somebody submits to the act intentionally in order to avoid whatever uh, threat has been uh, issued. So, in other words, if a rapist threatens somebody with serious personal injury or death, if they don't submit, and they choose to submit, they calculate that they have to submit, if, uh, assuming, of course, as may indeed be the case in some uh, instances, that it's possible to, uh, um, for the individual concerned to think this through, then it would be repugnant and absurd to say, well, they submitted intentionally, they made a choice to submit in order to escape the threat, therefore uh, the act was voluntary on their part. Because, of course, the law of rape, and this is a, 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 un, a, a characteristic that was identified as fundamental in the law of rape in every jurisdiction that was examined uh, in a, a review of the um, law by the uh, UN about uh, 10 years ago, the fundamental idea is that sexual penetration that is not voluntary or consensual qualifies as rape. So once you abandon the picture of the modern theory of the will and you stop thinking about acts of volition causing motion of the body and you ask yourself uh, how does the concept of voluntariness really work, then you can see that in fact uh, when we say that an act is voluntary if it is not due to compulsion, compulsion there is not limited to main force. So we can separate voluntariness and intention in that way. And of course what that reflects is the fundamental point that I made earlier, namely that voluntariness is at root an ethical concept. It's involved in thinking about innocence and guilt. So that's the first part of the uh, exposition that I wanted to give, focusing there on uh, what happens really when we separate the psychological and the ethical aspects of human agency. When we think about intentional conduct and voluntary conduct quite independently of each other and try to work out the details of how the concepts uh, uh, that we employ when we're thinking about these aspects of uh, um, human conduct interact. So now I'm going to move on um, and talk about the relationship and the distinction between the psychological and the physical dimensions of human agency. So this is quite a significant um, uh, change of topic and change of gear, but still remember that this is part of a larger project which is uh, thinking about each of these four dimensions of human agency independently of the other, trying to understand each in its own terms and trying to think about how they're related to each other. So here what we're concerned with is the physical and the psychological. We're concerned with the relationship between agency in general and intentional agency. And here again, the tendency in modern philosophy has been to equate these things precisely by saying 
that the test of whether some movement of a person's body is attributable to them personally as an agent, the test is whether it was caused by their volition or whether it was intentional on their part. And this is an idea that um, uh, originates, I think, in the 17th century. I don't believe that uh, one finds it earlier than, than that. Uh, I think that it, it probably begins in Descartes' Passions of the Soul. Um, Descartes, as you know, believed that each person is a purely thinking substance. Now, if you believe that, then of course you are bound to think that any change in the world attributable to an individual's, individual person's agency has to either consist in or be explained by one of that individual person's thoughts. Because that's all that a person ever does, is think. A person is a purely thinking substance. But interestingly, uh, long after uh, Descartes' uh, particular version of substance dualism had been um, uh, effectively abandoned in, by most philosophers, the idea that thought, intention, is or purpose is the mark of individual agency, persisted. So that the distinction between those changes in your body that are attributable to you as agent, like, for example, the movements of your lips when you speak, the movements of your legs when you walk, the distinction between those and the other kinds of movements that occur in your body that are not attributable to you as agent, like the contraction of your heart or the growth of your fingernails and so on, that distinction is drawn in terms of intention. The ones that are yours are the ones that are produced by your intention. And that is a very persistent doctrine in modern philosophy. You find it repeated by Bentham, by Reed before Bentham, by Davidson very recently uh, in the um, uh, 1970s. And I think it's fair to say that it uh, remains the uh, orthodox position today. So, you may find it plausible. After all, intention plays such a central role in uh, human behaviour. You might think that it is, in fact, definitive of it. And besides, it's hard to see what the alternative to that view is. How do we distinguish between those movements of our bodies that are attributable to us personally as agent and those that are not, if it isn't in terms of will or intention. What alternative picture is there? Still, if you're thinking as I am about these four different dimensions of human agency, then you should at least be skeptical about the idea. Uh, you should at least want to test whether in reality, it is intention that distinguishes between activity and passivity in human life, so that the perfectly general idea of action in the human case has this uh, psychological element, as it were, defining it. Uh, you should be sceptical about that idea if you're open to um, disaggregating the idea of the will in the way that I'm trying to do. Uh, one philosopher, as I mentioned earlier, who did challenge this idea is uh, Harry Frankfurt, and I've reproduced a paragraph um, for you on the handout. It's paragraph 16. Do you remember I mentioned towards the beginning of the lecture that Frankfurt thinks that we shouldn't distinguish activity, we shouldn't define activity in terms of intention, because we need to define it in terms that would also apply to <coughs> other animals that are just as active as we are, but aren't capable of having intentions. And here's the passage um, in which he sets this out. He says, it's uh, number 16, consider the difference between what goes on when a spider moves its legs in making its way along the ground and what goes on when its legs move in similar patterns and with similar effects because they are manipulated by a boy who has managed to tie strings to them. 
In the first case, the movements are not simply purposive as the spider's digestive processes doubtless are. They're also attributable to the spider who makes them. In the second case, the same movements occur, but they are not made by the spider to whom they merely happen. And Frankfurt thinks, well, we can't draw the distinction in terms of intention because spiders don't have intentions. So how should we draw it? Well, uh, at that point, I think it's fair to say that he gets stuck. And he says, well, the um, conditions of agency are indeed quite difficult to explain. And in a later article, he does revert to the idea that the distinguishing mark of agency, at least in the human case, is intention. I, I think that's wrong. I was impressed by Frankfurt's example. And um, because I think of human agency just in its physical dimension as centrally involving concepts like power, causation, change, it seems to me that we ought to be able to define it in terms that apply, at least uh, we ought to be able to define it in general terms so that it applies equally to every agent. That is, every substance capable of causing change. So, not just human beings, but spiders too. And not just spiders, but machines, which after all produce particular kinds of effect. Um, and even institutions. Uh, like universities and, and uh, governments and so on. Wherever we have uh, an agent producing change, we ought to be able to find some means of defining the changes attributable to its agency and distinguishing them from the others. And so what I've tried to do is to think about the agency of complex substances with functionally integrated parts in perfectly general terms. And I've set this out for you in paragraph 17. So this is, I should say, specifically about the agency of complex substances, and it is not specifically about the agency of thinking substances. And on both of those points, I am rejecting Descartes' position. And those are assumptions that I'm making, that we are not purely thinking substances, and we're not simple substances. So, just as it were, anticipating a little, if we do succeed in identifying a criterion of agency for complex agents with functionally differentiated parts in general, it should be clear why the alternative position that I'm rejecting, which began with Descartes, wasn't available to Descartes at that time. Because Descartes didn't think that we're complex agents. He thought we had no parts at all. We're purely simple substances without parts. And moreover, all we do is think. I'm rejecting those two assumptions. And I'm thinking about complex agents in general. And there are, I think, um, both natural and artificial complex agents. The natural uh, complex agents, as you can see, it's set out here for you, include organisms, like a spider or a human being, parts of organisms, like the heart or a blood cell, and superorganisms, a colony of bees, a Nanomia cara, which is um, a, a very strange kind of sea creature which I'm going to um, which I, if I have time, I'll tell you a little bit about. There's a picture of it on the handout. So there are these three kinds, organisms, parts of organisms, and superorganisms, three kinds of natural complex agent. And then there are also different kinds of artificial complex agent. So machines like a watch or a turbine, um, institutions like a university or a government department. And in each case, what we're interested in understanding is how to define the changes attributable to the agency of that complex as a whole, rather than to any of its parts. 
Can you see that? Because that's equivalent to, or that will guide us in thinking about how to distinguish between changes in the body attributable to us as a whole, like the movement of my lips when I speak, and changes in my body that are not attributable to me as a whole, as a personal agent, like the contraction of my heart, which is caused by part of my brain, but is not my doing personally as an agent. Okay? And I think the best place to start is actually not with um, a living creature. The best place to start is with an institution. And the reason that that's the best place to start is that we have designed it and we've said exactly how it works and exactly what powers it has and exactly what powers its parts have in the statutes and regulations governing the institution. In other words, we don't have to reverse engineer it because we engineered it. We designed it. We know exactly how it works because that was up to us. Think about the case of a university. So only a university, uh, I think this is true, it's certainly true of my university, has the power to confer a degree. So I was awarded a DPhil by the University of Oxford. What had to happen? Well, it was quite a complex sequence of events involving examiners and administrative officers and so on, and then eventually the vice-chancellor, I think this was a DPhil, it could have been an MA, um, tried to tap me on the head with a scroll or something. And when this complex sequence of events had, was completed, the university had conferred the degree on me. Not the vice-chancellor, notice. He doesn't have the power to do that. It has to be the integrated operation of these functionally differentiated parts, each of them doing their own bit, so that that adds up to the university as a whole conferring a degree. Think of the case now of a superorganism, like, for example, a swarm of bees. Do you know um, the, this famous waggle dance um, that bees, some people do, some people frown, and some people look vacant, and some people nod, so obviously some of you do and some of you don't. Um, so I think bees do this actually in two situations, but one of the situations in which they do it is when they need to choose a new place for a hive. And what happens is that the bees swarm in a convenient place, like in the branches of a tree, and then scouts go out, and if they encounter what seems to be a suitable place, they come back and they do this famous waggle dance. I'm not going to, don't worry. <laughs> and they go through a sort of figure of eight pattern, and they sort of waggle, um, uh, they move uh, laterally uh, along the kind of uh, long axis of the figure of eight. And they waggle more energetically and for longer in response to places that seem more attractive to them. And those um, sustained and energetic dances encourage other scout bees to go to the same place, which is indicated in the dance. The dance identifies the location. Um, so gradually, without any individual bee making a comparison, more and more bees are dancing vigorously, pointing at the same place, because the other scouts have gone out, they've found it appealing to, they've come back, they've joined in, that's encouraged more, and eventually, it's a bit like the Macarena, I think. They, they're all, all of this, there's a whole kind of crowd of them, and at that point, the swarm goes and makes a new hive there. And notice that there is a power or ability that belongs to the swarm and not to any of the individual bees, that is to choose the place for a new hive. And it happens as a result of the integrated operation of these different members of the, uh, of the swarm. So there again, you see, you have this principle of the functionally integrated operation of the parts of something um, identifying the agency of the whole. Think of, here's the last case that I'll describe. Think of the case of a watch. Which part of the watch is it that tells the time? I mean, I can easily imagine 
a school of philosophers in, let us say, Oxford, saying, oh, it's the hands of the watch that tell the time, because those are the bits that, you know, move when you follow them around the face. Then there's no doubt the Cambridge School, which says, no, no, it's the face that tells the time, because that's where the actual numbers, which o'clock it is, is recorded. Uh, I don't know, uh, UCL School says, no, no, it's, it's actually, it's neither of those things, it's the mainspring, because that's the source of energy, that's what drives, that's the bit that tells the time. And actually, we know that they're all wrong, because it's the watch that tells the time. How does it do so? It does so as a result of the integrated operation of these functionally differentiated parts. So there you have exactly the same model. And if you go back to uh, Frankfurt's spider, you can apply exactly the same principle, because you know, the spider has um, certain kinds of activity that are attributed to it uh, they are basic patterns of animal activity that are attributable to the animal, like um, feeding, um, <coughs> selecting and copulating with a mate, um, catching prey. These are things that the animal does. These are basic uh, communication, basic animal functions. They're attributed to the animal as a whole. How do, they, how do we distinguish between those things and the things that are not done by the spider as a whole but by parts of it, like, for example, the release of silk from a silk gland or the release of poison from a poison gland. How do we do it? Well, like every animal, it has sensory systems and motor systems and metabolic systems that maintain its life and activity generally. And it's the integrated operation of the sensory systems, motor systems and metabolic systems that enable us to identify the spider the spider's agency as a whole and distinguish it from the agency of its parts. And exactly the same thing, I think, applies in the case of a, of a human being. Not exactly the same thing, because in the case of a human being, we shouldn't, I think, be talking about just sensory systems and motor systems and metabolic systems. We should be thinking about cognitive systems, because our cognitive lives are more complex than those of, of spiders, and they include uh, the systems that are responsible for our intellectual and emotional lives, as well as uh, our um, ability to um, um, have uh, sensory perceptions of features of our environment. But the essential picture, the essential pattern, is the same. That is, it's the functionally integrated operation of the parts, rather than the operation of any specific part or faculty, like the amygdala or the will, which explains the activity of a human being as a whole. So if we think about ourselves in these perfectly general terms, as abstractly as we can, just as complex agents with functionally differentiated parts, then we can see how to separate the physical question, how to distinguish activity from passivity in human life, from the psychological question, how to define intentional agency, agency that is in um, uh, pursuit of a specific uh, purpose or goal. Uh, and so there we have the um, second uh, division that I wanted to explore, uh, this time between the physical and the psychological dimensions of human agency. And I'd just say, you know, in conclusion, that uh, these are, as I say, parts of uh, a larger picture. But what I hope to have illustrated is how it's possible to um, renew the philosophy of action and to really understand uh, the um, um, larger, more um, complex conception of uh, human agency um, that we um, uh, employ constantly in our daily lives to understand that better if we abandon the modern theory of the will, not just by denying the existence of volitions, not just by denying that the question of whether an act is voluntary is to be answered by identifying some kind of mental cause, but if we disaggregate the will, if we separate these different dimensions 
of human action. And so I think that's uh, where I shall stop. Thank you.